Greetings and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. My name is Rose Mason and our guest today is Mary Yoko Brennan. Mary Yoko is a professor of international business at the University of Victoria and is the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives Japan Chair. She holds an MBA with a focus in international business and a PhD in organizational behavior from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She has not only taught at various universities in the United States, Japan, China, and France, but has also worked as a cross-cultural consultant for Fortune 500 companies. Mary Yoko has co-authored a paper titled Strategic Ethnography and Reinvigorating Tesco PLC, Leveraging Inside and Outside Bicultural Bridging in Multicultural Teams. Mary Yoko, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. First, before we dive into your work with Tesco, could you tell us a little bit about what ethnography is and why it's important in today's world? All right. Well, ethnography comes from the Greek word ethnography, oh, which, is, uh, with, which is people writing. Mm -hmm. So it's writing about people. And it has become the main uh, mode of research in anthropology. And it's the study of people in their own context. And it involves participant observation, where a researcher goes into the field and actually lives with the people that they study, and oftentimes takes on a role in the community um, that they are studying. And the other part of it is it involves interviews. So it's researching by means of actually living in the context that you're studying, doing participant observation and interviewing. That's great. It mm -hmm. seems like a lot of ground level work there. Mm -hmm. um, so you worked with Tesco, which is one of the largest supermarkets in not only the UK, but the world. Um, could you give us some background on the 2011 study on Tesco and what kind of challenges Tesco was facing at the time? Yes, yes. So Tesco is the third largest, uh, most profitable retail uh, uh, company in the world after Walmart, and I, I know I'm in Walmart country here, <laughs> um, and then Carrefour. And in 2011, uh, late 2010, uh, Tesco began to lose its comp competitiveness in its home market in the UK. Uh, in fact, uh, its profits had fallen about 6%, which was the first time its profits had fallen in over 20 years. Wow. Yes. But at the same time, uh, its profits worldwide had grown by over 12%. Oh. And so it, it was an unusual situation where profits at home were lagging behind profits, uh, worldwide profits. Mm -hmm. And these profits were being led by its Asian subsidiaries. And Tesco at the time was operating in six uh, Asian countries, mm -hmm. uh, China, Korea, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia, and India. Wow. And so these Asian subsidiaries were leading the worldwide growth of, of Tesco. Also happening at that time was a big change in Tesco's hierarchy. Uh, and Terry uh, Leahy, mm -hmm. who had taken uh, Tesco from a kind of a, a low-cost uh, provider of food uh, mm -hmm. and, and sundries to becoming uh, the number one employer in England. And uh, I think it was known before that uh, he took the realm uh, of a company that piled it high and sold it cheap. Oh. Um, and I think we know companies like that in the United <laughs> States. But um, uh, he was able to bring it up to uh, a place where it was known for quality food and for being a, one of the best places to work, that, that you would be able to um, have the opportunity, what they called the opportunity to get on, which means that you could go from cart boy all the way to CEO, which actually Terry Lee he himself did. He was from a working class background in Liverpool, yeah. England, uh, and was started out at Tesco just carting um, carts and um, on the shop floor and becoming the CEO. 
So kind of a, a story that we're used to in the United States, mm -hmm. the rags to riches, but not at all the case in, in the UK. So it not, not only did it um, did he change the, the image of Tesco from um, kind of a cheap uh, wholesaler to a place where you could get quality food and, and feed your whole family uh, to a place where you would want to work wow. and advance yourself, yeah. But anyway, at this time um, of the study, what was interesting was he, he stepped down and Philip Clark took the helm of Tesco. And uh, also at that time, a new CEO of Asia was appointed, David Potts. And interestingly, Tesco had the, um, uh, the management uh, policy of interna internationalization where they would take uh, home country executives to head up regional operations. Uh, and David Potts, uh, being a thoughtful manager, uh, thought, well, I don't know anything about Asia, <laughs> and Asia's leading the profits. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, what, what might w we learn from the Asian subsidiaries that could help uh, uh, Tesco back at home? And mm -hmm. so that was kind of the um, impetus of this project. Wow, Tesco seemed to be in a really unique position in 2011 with all the change and the differences in profit. That's right. Wow. Okay. Could you tell us what role um, ethnography played with the situation that was going on in Tesco? Yeah. So um, because of this uh, situation where their profits were being led kind of at the periphery at, at, uh, rather than from home, uh, together with David Potts, um, I worked out a, a, a project wherein they could utilize uh, their Asian managers, some of their Asian managers, to be able to shine some light on uh, what might be some best practices from the Asian subsidiaries that could then be adopted in Tesco UK. Mm -hmm. And so I put together an academic team uh, to train nine Asian managers mm -hmm. in ethnography. Oh. Because as I told you earlier, mm -hmm. ethnography is, is the method of choice mm -hmm. um, where people can learn about a, a a culture in its own context. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what was good about the situation was it was kind of what we'd call a twofer in mm -hmm. American in mm -hmm. that um, these, by having their own managers from their own organizations come to the UK, they would be able to not only learn from them, uh, from their insider outsider eyes um, what uh, about Tesco's UK practices might need uh, revitalizing okay. but at the same time then the nine managers could learn more about the UK context mm -hmm. and so therefore there'd be more global integration of Tesco's operations. Oh, it seems like a great learning process for both parties involved. And for me and, and yeah. my academic team as well. Cause <laughs> I it, bet. It was the first time uh, that we knew of um, mm -hmm. where ethnography was actually taught to insiders of a company. Okay. And so it was kind of uh, a very quick uh, course mm -hmm. in ethnography. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, what are some of the key takeaways that you got from your time with Tesco? Wow. Um, well, from the project, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I, I guess we can think about this from two points of view. Mm -hmm. What did Tesco get from it? Yes. And then what did uh, we, the academic team, get from it? Mm -hmm. And so what did international business education get from it? Mm -hmm. So which one would you like me to answer first? Oh, <laughs> let's go in order of how you listed them. <laughs> okay. Well, for Tesco, we mm -hmm. were able to, so, so the project was, um, lasted three months where, where the ethnographer, where the insider, outsider um, ethnographers that we called the project team came over and they spent um, three months visiting 52 Tesco stores in the UK, uh, including Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, they would go as pairs mm -hmm. uh, and, and spend a week in each store. And they took field notes just like an anthropologist would, mm -hmm. um, kind of like flies on the walls of the stores. Mm -hmm. And um, what the academic team did is devise a field note-taking strategy 
um, where they would were supposed to um, pay attention to three things. So, and we called that the flying spaghetti monster, FSM. What's familiar? Mm -hmm. What's surprising? Okay. And what do I want to learn more about? Okay. And they were to take notes on the flying spaghetti monster mm -hmm. in each of the contexts that they were in. And in so doing, um, they created uh, you know, pages and pages of field notes that then the academic team helped them analyze in order to surface what were the key areas in which they could contribute to Tesco's uh, renewal. Mm -hmm. And I think we came up with about 34 different areas that then we whittled down into 10 main uh, aspects uh, where they could help give recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And um, in many of those areas, they're already improving mm -hmm. upon their practices. That's yeah. great. Seems mm -hmm. like it was a great experience for them, especially going to so many stores and getting that field work in there. Yeah. Yeah. One of them actually wanted to, you know, switch jobs and become an anthropologist. Really? <laughs> well, just said you that didn't later. Think of them. But, yeah, that <laughs> wasn't what Tesco really wanted us to do. But, yeah. Oh wow! So after doing the study and, and learning what you did, how do you see the future of Tesco now? Well, I I think. Uh, I think it's a difficult uh, thing to answer. I, I think they, they've had quite a few stumbling blocks over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in still in their home market. I think uh, directly after the study, they began to rethink their internationalization policies and uh, employ and, and, and give more credence to what is going on in their overseas subsidiaries. Um, what they can learn from them, and uh, that it was important for them to revitalize some of their practices. And one of the one of the issues, I mean, just to give one of the ten for an, an example, mm -hmm. um, uh, or I, I could maybe mention two very different ones. But one one was in regards to the opportunity to get on issue. Um, even though this was a, a very important uh, criteria for people to join Tesco, what the researchers found out is that not very many people had taken that uh, opportunity or, or were actually, I guess, taken the opportunity. They, they may have been given it. And by, by that was something they found that was surprising because it was one of the... Um, uh, catch lines about Tesco opportunity to get on yeah. and when they went to find more about this what they found out is that in order to ta uh, take the opportunity to get on uh, an employee at Tesco needed to be able to move uh, geographical geographically mm -hmm. somewhere in the UK and also to take on a different type of job so that they might have been stock boy they might have to go to um, maybe the um, the online ordering uh, business, et cetera, et cetera, and so uh, what what we recommended as as the uh, as the project team was that they needed to be clearer up front what was what, what the opportunity to get on involved right. and set the expectations more properly. That kind of thing, you know. Another one was. Um, they learned from the Korean subsidiary, for example. The Korean subsidiary was a joint venture with Samsung. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, one of the innovations that, that uh, HomePlus, uh, which is the name of Tesco in Korea, came up with was an app for your smartphone, you know, Samsung smartphone, of um, uh, which was a Tesco app where they, they could actually, while waiting for their trains, when uh, commuting to and from work, they could scan using a barcode app scanner on their oh. iPhone um, products that they wanted, that they needed, you know, the food products at home from a, a placard, you know, at the, at the train station. And then they could order it online, and by the time they got home, there was their food. Wow. You know, so this is the kind of thing that you can learn just from, you know, the serendipity of, of the entry strategies and the partnerships that they've had to then implement at home. And so I, I think any, any com multinational that is sensing knowledge 
uh, from their periphery mm -hmm. and melding it back to home and then redeploying it is going to be a successful firm. I think Walmart better watch out. <laughs> it sounds like it. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other uses for ethnography in business that you've discovered during your career? Mm -hmm. Well, it's my main method right. um, as an academic researcher. Um, and I, I think the main uses of ethnography is to understand, to have deep understanding of context. And the uh, consultants uh, abound um, that have templates for companies on whatever issue it is that they're faced with, um, whether it be uh, change programs or whether it be um, internationalization strategies or market entry strategies. Mm -hmm. But these templates are not custom made fully. And so, and even if they were custom made, they're, uh, they don't involve uh, interviews um, with uh, employees in their own context. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't involve the consultants living with the employees themselves, you know, so stepping into the shoes of the employees. Mm -hmm. And as global competition becomes more and more severe, mm -hmm. I think that there's not going to be uh, a, a better way uh, to compete than to use insider ethnographers. Wow. Because if, if it's insider, mm -hmm. then you keep the knowledge inside. Ah. Yes, you see, key. and yeah, and so that's very uh, an important strategy, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add onto our discussion today? Yeah, maybe one thing, which which comes from another area of research that I do, which is on biculturals, oh. um, as an important human resource for companies. Um, statistics are showing that the largest in, uh, the largest demographic that's entering the workforce is bicultural meaning people with more than one uh, deep socialization in, 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 a, in a culture. And um, I think California by 2014, which is now, 60% um, of the incoming workforce will be bicultural. Wow. Yeah. And uh, the study we did at Tesco was using biculturalism at the organizational level. So we had people from Asian subsidiaries be insider and outsiders. So that's the, but they weren't internally bicultural, mm -hmm. per se. Although a, a couple of the managers that we trained were uh, uh, knew English very well and knew the English context better than others. Um, but w what, what I'd like to end with is, is the importance of understanding this demographic and that um, being bicultural doesn't necessarily mean that you're bilingual. Mm -hmm. um, and it, not all biculturals um, have internalized their biculturalism the same. Mm -hmm. And so some biculturals are uh, people who are homeless that were neither a part of the country that they're growing up in, right. nor did they understand the country that of their parents. Right. You know, and these biculturals are particularly good as ethnographers, okay. because they only always were participant observers, mm -hmm. and so they pay attention to things that others take for granted. Mm -hmm. There are other biculturals that are um, what we call both ends. You know, that that they they have really. Uh, understood and feel integrated in both of their cultures. Mm -hmm. And these are, are bicultures that are very uh, useful to companies in terms of explaining different contexts and culture-specific information. Okay. Whereas the, well, the neither nors are, are probably better at uh, pointing out things that nobody else has noticed. Right. And so this is a, a very important opportunity for companies um, to understand what are the skill sets that these people bring. Yeah, it seems definitely like in this day and age that's becoming more and more important. Right. Well, thank you, Mir Yoko, so much for your time and coming here today to speak with us. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to the Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis for bringing Mary Yoko to campus. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, 
please contact us at ciber at indiana.edu.